All right, we're doing chapter nine, electrostatics. Hopefully you did the static electricity demos. Now we're gonna get into the details. Scientists have identified the four fundamental forces of nature. You're all familiar with the gravitational force. It's not very strong unless we have a lot of mass. This is why we need like a planet in order for us to notice gravity. It works across great distances. It's a very large scale kind of force. It's what holds the solar system together and it holds the galaxy together. Next, we have the electromagnetic force. It has two parts. We're going to study the electrostatic part. The magnetic force we'll study later. They used to be considered two separate forces, but scientists have been able to find a way to relate the two. It's stronger than gravity, but we notice it on a shorter scale than gravity. You were able to see this force in your electrostatics demonstrations, so we can definitely see it on a human scale right in our laboratory. It's also the force that causes chemical bonding. The electron is negative, the proton is positive. So this is what helps hold an atom together and form bonds. The next two forces, the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force, obviously they work in the nucleus. They're both a lot stronger than gravity and they work on a very short range within the nucleus. The weak nuclear force relates to radioactive decay of the subatomic particles. And the strong nuclear force is what's holding these subatomic particles together. Without the strong nuclear force, we wouldn't be able to have a nucleus. So this is the big picture. And we're going to talk about the electrostatic force. Well, I'm sure a long time ago, you learned what would happen if two positive charges were near each other. You learned that like charges repel. Opposites attract. Then in chemistry, maybe you learned something about the Rutherford gold foil experiment where he shot positive particles at a very thin film of gold. Most of the particles went right through. Some bounced back. He was expecting to find positive and negative charges in the gold foil rather evenly distributed. But the experiment showed that most of the positive charges were lumped together. That made no sense to him because likes repelled. And he thought these things would be all over the place. But no, they were collected in centers. These were the centers that caused the incoming particles to bounce back. This led to the idea of the Bohr model for the atom. Electrons went around a nucleus. Kids learn this in school. They learn that likes repel, and then they get shown a nucleus with a bunch of likes in there. Doesn't that make you wonder how could they be stuck together? Protons are actually attracted to each other through the strong nuclear force but it actually isn't enough to overcome the electrostatic repulsions of the positive charges. How could we increase the nuclear force that holds it together without increasing the electrostatic repulsions? We add neutrons. Neutrons won't cause any repulsions. They'll only add to the strong nuclear force to help hold the nucleus together. Also in chemistry, some of you may have seen this formula. It's Coulomb's law. If we have two charges separated by a distance r, we can use this formula to calculate the electrostatic force acting on each charge. Q represents the charge measured in something called coulombs. An electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Well, does that formula look familiar? How about that? Newton's universal law of gravitation. If we have an M1 and an M2 separated by a distance r, center to center, we could use this formula to calculate the force of gravity. Well, what's the difference between here and here? Even though the masses are positive, the forces are towards each other. Well, here the charges are positive and the forces are away from each other. Well, sometimes you'll actually see this formula with a negative sign. We say that if we have a negative force, it's attractive. If the force is positive, we say it's repulsive. Now, mass is always positive. Charges don't have to be. If we make one of them negative, the force is attractive. And we don't need a negative sign in this formula. It's handled by Q itself. Negative times a positive is a negative force. Now, you're probably noticing that each one of them has an R squared in it. 
Well, where did the R squared come from gravity? It has to do with the fact that the field lines are spreading out as we move away from this mass. The area that these field lines penetrate is 4 pi r squared. The further out you go, the more spread out they are. So that's where the r squared comes from in the formula. When r is bigger, f gets smaller. It's an inverse squared law. Well, these electric charges also have field lines. We call it the electric field, as opposed to lowercase g, which represented the gravitational field. Why are these arrows pointed outward? You can always tell the direction of the arrow by imagining a positive test charge placed in the area and see which way the force is exerted on it. It's just like putting a little mass near a planet and seeing which way it goes. It goes in, so the field lines go in. A positive test charge will go out. We always use a positive test charge to determine the direction of an electric field. These field lines will also pass through an area. And it's also 4 pi r squared. And that's why that has the r squared in it as well. Remember, this is the area of the sphere because this is happening in three dimensions. It's not a circle. And what would happen if that charge was negative? You ask yourself, what would the positive test charge do near the negative charge? It'll get pulled in. So that's the direction of the electric field for a negative charge. And that's what happens with the Earth. Then field lines are going towards the center. We don't have the option in gravity for field lines going away. For the last part of the formula, we need to look at the constant that's going to convert all of this into Newtons, the same way we have capital G converting all of this to Newtons. You might remember Henry Cavendish measuring G, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newtons meter squared per kilogram squared. In a similar way, we have K for the electrostatic formula, and it's 8.99 times 10 to the 9th. What are the units? Well, we have to have Newtons, so it has to have a Newton in here. We have to cancel the Coulombs in here. We put them on the bottom, and we want to get rid of the meters squared, so we put them on top. What's bigger? Yeah, that. By a little bit, by times 10, times 100. Is it a million times bigger? You realize that's a billion? That's 10 to the minus 11. This number is actually a billion times a billion times a hundred times bigger than that number. Remember we said electrostatic forces are stronger than gravity? Yeah, way stronger. Let's do an example with a hydrogen atom. We have a proton, we have an electron. You know the electron goes around the proton. What keeps it in the circular motion? Yeah, it's the electrostatic force. Now, the proton is also pulled to the electron, but it has a lot of mass. It's not going to go anywhere, not compared to that very lightweight electron that's going to go in the circle. Now, if the hydrogen atom has a radius of about 5 times 10 to the minus 11 meters, we can calculate that force. Here we have it. That's the value of K. This is the charge on the proton. That's the charge on the electron. And we can put the negative sign right here. We're going to divide by 5 times 10 to the minus 11th meters squared. And we get 9.2 times 10 to the negative 8th newtons. Now, I know you're going to say that's a really small force. Well, let's figure out what really holds this atom together. Is this the force? Or could it be gravity? We know what G is. Now we need the mass of the proton. That's 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The mass of an electron is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And it's still the same distance apart. Well, the force of gravity is going to be 4.1 times 10 to the minus 47 newtons. Now, that is a small number. Yeah, you thought that was small until you find something really small. So this is what's holding that atom together. It's not gravity. Let's talk a little bit more about the electric field. Here we have a charge, Q, and it's producing an electric field. E. But how do we know that electric field is there? We have to imagine we have a positive test charge. It's a small amount of charge. And it will have a force exerted in this direction. If we take that force and divide by that charge, we get the strength of the field. The greater the force for that same test charge, the stronger the field. 
It's just like gravity producing the gravitational field. You imagine that little mass getting pulled in. And we said the strength of the gravitational field is the force acting on that mass per mass. So you might remember that the strength of the gravitational field was equal to G capital M, the mass of the central body, divided by R squared. If we multiplied both sides of the equation by little m, then we have the acceleration due to gravity times m, which was the gravitational force. Well, it's the same thing with the electrostatic field. If we have Coulomb's law, we could take the little q and divide on both sides and have f over q. That's the electric field. Now keep in mind, this is all for point charges or spherical charges, same thing with the mass. Well, let's take a look at these two charges, the same magnitude, but opposite sign. Let's ask what the electric field will be right between them. You have to imagine placing a positive test charge where you want to examine the strength of the electric field. The positive charge is going to push the test charge to the right. I'll call that E1. The negative charge is going to pull it to the right. We can call that E2. Well, these are vectors. Electric fields can be just added like vectors. We can throw in some numbers and make a problem out of this. Let's say that was three coulombs and that was three coulombs. And we're right in between them at 10 meters and 10 meters away. So we can calculate E1, we can calculate E2. Plugging in the numbers, we get 2.7 times 10 to the eighth newtons per coulomb. Well, we're going to get the same thing over here too. But you might be saying, what happened to the negative sign? Well, you don't use the negative sign, you use the absolute value here. And when you're looking at vectors, you look at their arrows on the diagram to determine which way it's going. They're both going in the same direction, so we add them up. And we get 5.4 times 10 to the eighth newtons per coulomb. So we just calculated the electric field strength between these two charges. Well, what if the point was up here that we were studying? Imagine we have our positive test charge there. What will this charge do to it? It'll push it away. What will this charge do to it? It's going to pull it towards it. Well, to get the net electric field, we need to add these vectors. In order to do that, we need to know the magnitude of each of these values. What is the value of E1? Well, it's going to be K times this Q divided by R squared. So where is R? R is on a diagonal. So we need to know the location of this point. If we know X and Y, we can find R. We can put that in the equation. And we can do the same to get the magnitude of this electric field. We'll use this charge here divided by R squared. And in this case, R is going from this charge to that point in space. So let's put some numbers to the situation and you can try a problem. Well, just like we had before, we have 10 meters and 10 meters, positive two coulombs, negative two coulombs. And now we're gonna be up here and we'll make Y equal to five meters. See if you can calculate the electric field from each one of these charges and then add these vectors. We'll check the answer later. Good luck.